right, I'll tell you what happened. All right, so I got home. I got an argument with my mom. She slapped me across the face. She began to hit me. She started beating me. I didn't like it, so I strangled her to death. This is Gregory Ramos, and you are witnessing the chilling moment where he casually confessed to the murder of his mother. Following a heated argument, Gregory did his absolute best to stage the crime scene as a burglary. Thankfully, detectives were not buying his story, and although they were initially met with a wall of doubt, they would eventually unearth the admissions of a cold-hearted, callous killer. But who precisely is Gregory? What triggered him to murder his mother? What evidence was found in the wake of his confession, and will he ever see freedom again? Welcome or welcome back to Coffee House Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at the condensed story of Gregory Ramos. Now, Gregory has become somewhat infamous for his terribly blunt admission of guilt. Coffee House Crime covers many liars and killers, but this story will turn your blood cold. Now, there are several videos already covering this story on YouTube, but with many of them far surpassing the hour mark, I thought I'd create one that's a little more direct and that focuses on the timeline. And also, apologies for the change in environment, folks. I'm currently away and recording on business. More on that in a week or two. If you're new here, I like to caffeinate while I investigate darkly fascinating stories. If that does sound like your kind of thing, please grab yourself a coffee, subscribe, and get comfortable. This is the case of Gregory Ramos. Welcome to Florida, folks. Now, it's no secret that there must be something in Florida's water, because this state always has the wildest stories when it involves people and their behavior. Known for its beach resorts, amusement parks, warm and sunny climate, nautical recreation, and of course, Miami Beach, this place needs no introduction whatsoever. Today, we're swinging by De Barry, a small city on the eastern shore of St. John's River, and also found north of Orlando. And one of those families living there was Gail Clevenger and her husband, son, and two stepchildren. Gail Elaine Clevenger, who was born on July the 4th, 1972, was one of six children. Her parents ran a tight ship in the Goretzky household. And with four other sisters and a brother, her childhood was the picture of a collected chaos. But despite the busy home, Gail was a happy child who grew up to be fearless and independent. Interested in self-expression through art, she began taking violent lessons when she was little. She was a dedicated painter and even had a good hand for sketching and drawing. After graduating from Merritt Island High School in 1990, she enrolled at the University of Miami, where she studied architecture. And after graduating with top marks, Gail was ready to take on the world with everything that she had. Despite architecture being a challenging industry to break into, she found her first job in no time whatsoever. And although she was professionally soaring, behind the scenes in her personal life, she was unfortunately struggling with a rather abusive marriage. With help from her friends and her family, Gail finally managed to leave her abusive husband behind for good, and move forward in her life for the better. And despite being emotionally scarred from the trauma she endured from her first marriage, she was still open to giving love a second chance. Her second husband, named Daniel Clevenger, was just that person. And now in a better relationship, Gail could fully relax into herself and start a family that she always wanted. The year was 2018. Gail now lived with her husband, Daniel, her son, Gregory, and his two step-siblings. Although she was now succeeding professionally and many other aspects of her life were going quite well, she was struggling to deal with the increasing friction between herself and her teenage son, Greg. Born in the year 2003, Gregory Ramos was not the most social kid on the block. While he did have some friends, he was also quite comfortable hanging out alone. Due to this reason, Gail enrolled him into the Boy Scouts and Karate from a very young age, in the hopes of getting her son involved in something both physically and socially engaging. Taking it a step further, she was such a good mum that she even participated in these extracurricular activities, spending countless hours with him in his scouts group and enrolling herself into his karate classes. By 2018, Gregory was 15 years old, living in Volusia County and attending University High School. He also had several friends, but by no means was the most popular kid in school. People in his classes would say that Gregory was innately average, Nothing about him stood out in a good or a bad way. 
In one of his school projects, he made a video introducing first-year students to their new school. In this video, he can be seen acting with enthusiasm and slight awkwardness. Now, Greg would sometimes see his friends outside of school, but for the most part, he preferred to be in his room or on his computer. Over the years, Greg had fostered an interest in computer games and music as a side hobby. And so, with a top-of-the-line gaming PC and a speaker setup in his bedroom, he often played and listened to music late into the night. He was also interested in law enforcement and was a member of the local police explorers unit. Teachers noticed that Greg was a bright child who didn't need much effort to succeed. The problem is, he didn't care enough to apply himself. Now Gail was aware of her son's intelligence and lack of academic drive. It seemed that, outside of gaming and listening to music, school was the last thing on his mind. This type of parent-teenager relationship is fairly typical, and I'm sure that many of you have even been in the same situation before. However, Greg and Gail never seemed to find common ground. Greg knew that he was smart, but furthermore, he hated it when his mother told him what to do. And although his grades improved throughout most of 2018, in November, they once again began to slip. Biology seemed to be his biggest gripe, with him routinely landing D grades throughout most of his assignments. He didn't seem to care for the human body whatsoever, which, moving forward, is a chilling detail in this story. Today's story pulls us to the evening of November the 1st, 2018, where the perfect storm for an argument had silently been building. Greg's stepfather, who typically was the mediator in his arguments with his mother, was away on a business trip, and to add to that, his step-siblings were also away too. This meant that the only two at home were Greg and his mother, and sadly, considering his recent grades, they were already on a rocky foundation. Now, as far as as everyone outside of the property knew, the evening remained to be uneventful. The following morning was unremarkable by all counts too, and as the high school welcomed its students, the day progressed as usual with classes in full swing by mid-morning. However, after the school day concluded, the Volusia County Emergency Hotline received a troubling call from a very distressed young man. 911, where's your emergency? Um. I, I I just got home, and the the my house is completely trashed. It looks like someone broke in the side door. Okay. How I, long have you been? How long have you been gone? I I've, I've been gone all school day. Um, I've okay. got home. Are you there by yourself? Yeah. I'm how old are you? Mom. I'm are I'm you? 15. Okay. And like. My mom's car is here and it's on, and she's not home, and she's supposed to go to work today, and I can't okay, find your her. Mom is, okay, okay. Your mom's car is there. Is there any other way she ever gets to work? Does she ever get a ride from anyone else? She, no, she, it's on. The car is on. It's turned on. The car on. is on, and you're sure she is not there? I searched the entire place. I've been here for like eight minutes. I've been looking. Okay. I can't find her. Okay, I want you to stay on the phone with me. We are not going to disconnect until I have an officer that is with you, okay? Okay. Okay, do we, did you see anyone leave the house? No. Okay. Stay on the phone with me. I'm making a couple of notes. Are you safe where you're at? Yeah, yeah that doesn't sound your name here. I checked the entire house because I was looking for her, but she's not here. <laughs> As the police responded to the address at 35th Alicante Street, they discovered Gregory alone, visibly distressed, and in a great state of panic. As the officers questioned Gregory, their colleagues examined the property. The evidence of a break-in was glaringly apparent. The door had been forcefully torn off its hinges, and visible wreckage was discernible both from the exterior and the interior of the house. Upon navigating the home, the officers were struck with shock at the destruction that met their eyes. This wasn't merely just a burglary case, because the residence appeared to be thoroughly ransacked and almost obliterated. Every section of the house had been subjected to chaos. Kitchen cabinets had flung wide open, and glassware and plates had shattered on the ground. In addition to the mayhem, the police observed that Greg's mother's car was still present, yet she herself was nowhere to be found. This information was concerning to officers, and Greg himself, 
Well, he voiced genuine worry about his mother's whereabouts. After listening to Greg and sympathizing with his heightened emotional state, officers took him down to the local station to give him a place to calm down. Being distraught, confused, and primarily concerned about his missing mother, Greg definitely needed parental guidance in the absence of his stepfather. With his stepfather away, Greg sought solace and decided to reach out to Ken Jones, this being his sponsor and close friend found in the police explorers. In a short time frame, Ken arrived at the station abruptly and offered support and comfort to Greg. And now in a room with his mentor to his left and an officer across from him, the officer asked Greg a few questions. Now, if Greg genuinely had no involvement with this incident, then you would believe that he would be willing to provide as much information to officers as possible. Investigators expressed concern over the visible marks all over Greg's face. He had bruises under his eyes, around his nose, mouth, and on his chin. This moment in the interview held significant weight and expressed the tone for what lay ahead, because although you would expect a relatively straightforward answer, that is not what they received. Greg claimed that he got into a fight at school, but was rather vague and coy with the details. In fact, he tried to avoid the topic altogether, and couldn't even provide a surname. Sergeant Pagliari sat silently as he observed Greg's behavior and body language. It became clear that, over time, he was growing skeptical. And so, with that in mind, he began to poke further. It became clear that Greg was very uneasy. He displayed self-soothing body language such as smoothing his hair, rubbing his leg, and shielding his eyes with one hand. His crossed arms displayed a defensive demeanor while he conveyed the information to officers. Greg recalled his day to the officer, specifying that he was out all day before returning home at 8.47 p.m. Now, interestingly enough, but although he could precisely tell the time of his arrival, he could not remember his dinner. Nevertheless, he insisted that the evening was like any other night. The dialogue then pivoted towards Greg's relationship with his mother, Gale, as Sergeant Pagliari sought to understand their dynamics. And although Greg admitted that, while at times his relationship with her could be tumultuous, when asked if he would ever lay a hand on her, he replied with, I would never do such a thing. In fact, Greg would go on to repeat this three more times, desperately trying to reassure both the sergeant and his mentor that he was not the type of person to be physical. It became clear that the boy was trying his hardest to appear calm and especially non-violent. But Pagliari, he wasn't buying his story. And then, all of a sudden, around one hour into his interview, Greg suddenly snapped. What did they tell you? I'm not telling you what they told me, because I don't have to tell you what they told me. You tell me what happened. I already told you what happened. Tell me you didn't kill your mother. I didn't. Who killed your mother? I have zero clue. Who took the shit out of your house? Well, you just told me. Apparently it's my friends. And when did they think they did that? I have zero fucking clue. Do you honestly believe the things that are coming out of your mouth? Yeah. So, when your buddy says that you told him you killed your mother, he's lying. slapped me across the face, she began to hit me, she started beating me, I didn't like it, so I strangled her to death, alright? I put her in a wheelbarrow, I put her in my car, I took the car, I had a mental breakdown where I almost committed suicide three times, I drove around Daytona, I dropped the wheelbarrow in some random ass location, and then I drove back to the church, I began to dig a hole, I dig a hole right under the fucking fire pit, um, I, dug, I dug a pretty deep hole, pretty deep, um, you know, deep enough to put a bit of body in, alright? Um, all this time my mom's deacon building body, I dragged it from the, 
from my car to the to the fire pit in which case I tried to cut the wedding ring off her finger because I wanted to pawn it but I couldn't because I didn't have a knife strong enough to cut bones oh well whatever anyways so I dug dug that hole threw her body in there filled it back in made it look all nice and natural dumped my clothes and then I went home and I caught a ride to school with my friends and yeah and yeah what about the part that you staged a crime scene oh yeah I forgot about that part oh so um, in the middle of the night I realized that hey my mom just up and disappears that's not going to make any sense so um, I decided to make it look like a box of robbery so I just went to my house and I just <laughs> threw shit everywhere um, which looked pretty convincing um, and yeah this distinct shift from being stoic to oversharing may seem surprising, but once being confronted with the reality that his friends had exposed him, he realised that he had nothing to hide. You see, after murdering his mother, Gregory asked his friends, Dylan and Brian, to help cover up the crime. Perhaps he thought that they would have his back but it suddenly dawned on him that they were now being interviewed too. As the three boys began to divulge on what really happened on that fateful day, investigators were able to piece together a timeline. After a heated argument that later turned into a murderous rampage, Greg was desperately trying to figure out how to cover up his tracks. Using a wheelbarrow, he wheeled her corpse outside and loaded her into a van. Driving to his nearby church, he then took a small footpath to a fire pit behind the parish, and then began to dig a shallow grave for his mother. Once Gale was buried, he then returned home to rough up his house in an attempt to stage, in his own words, a botched robbery. The following day, Greg contacted Brian and Dylan. He said to them that he needed a ride to school, and asked if they could stop by to pick him up. He also mentioned that something big had happened the night prior, but was hesitant to specify over the phone. Once the two boys arrived, Greg hopped in the car and, on the way to school, dropped the bombshell, confessing that the night prior, he had murdered his mother. Following this devastating news, the trio then went about their business as usual, before deciding to ditch class just before sixth period. They then returned to Greg's house, where Brian and Dylan helped him stage the crime scene. They did this by first kicking down the door. Next, they emptied the drawers by smashing up cups and plates onto the kitchen floor. They then took various personal items to Gail's burial site, hiding them in a nearby bush. Interesting side note, but Brian and Dylan also took advantage of the situation by keeping some of Greg's possessions for themselves. This included his speakers, hunting rifle, hunting bow, and even his gaming PC. After returning to Greg's home, they then wished him good luck before driving away. And right away after they left, Greg made the 911 call to report his mother missing. In the end, those personal items that Dylan took home would lead to his confession. Realising that he had his stuff, officers could trap him in a lie by asking him how he came to have Greg's hunting bow and gaming PC in his possession. Soon enough, the young boy cracked under this pressure. Brian, on the other hand, was harder to crack. He stubbornly gave the officers a different story. However, after learning that Dylan had now confessed, he knew that the game was over. So, we now have two high school students with detailed confessions who are pointing the finger at their friend. This was enough for detectives to actively apply pressure to Gregory, and eventually, he caved. With a timeline established, all three boys were taken into custody, and at the end of his interrogation, Greg was taken to the church, where he provided grisly details over his mother's murder. During this trip, Greg mentioned where his mother's gravesite could be found, and also mentioned how hard it was to put her body into the hole. It became apparent that, during this entire exercise, he seemed to be gloating about the details. While Greg was walking around, both Brian and Dylan were in the back of a nearby patrol car, unaware that they were being recorded. 
At the time, they were asked to detail all significant details of their involvement. During this time frame, it became rather clear that the two were utterly oblivious to how much trouble they were in. They often joked about how long they'd be grounded for, and even sang along to the radio. Eventually, all three boys were reunited in the back of a patrol car, and then transported to the Department of Juvenile Justice. After arriving, they were booked and processed, and after being detained, Gregory, Brian and Dylan made their first appearances on Sunday, the 4th of November. Despite being 15 years old at the time, Gregory was charged as an adult for the first degree murder of his mother. He was also charged with abuse of a dead body and tampering with evidence. To avoid a humiliating and outrageous trial, and a possible life sentence, he pled guilty to all crimes. It was highly emotional in the courtroom that day, with most of Gail's family present. Many gave very emotional statements, including Gail's siblings Joe, Ivy, and Lynn. Gail's older sister, Lynn, detailed the incredibly difficult process of losing a loved family member, especially at the hands of one of their own. She said, as I mourn the loss of not just one person, but two, the world has less depth and colour, and is much less of a place because Gail is gone. When it was time for Gregory to take to the stand, he apologised for his actions and how they impacted his family. He said, because of my actions, I will never get to truly know my mum. Not only did I steal my mother from myself, but from everybody else as well. I have done irreversible harm to the world." Greg ended his statement by asking for mercy for his two friends, Brian and Dylan, by saying, "...they do not deserve to be incarcerated for my actions." They never realised the full extent of the crime, and when they were arrested, they cooperated with the police fully. Please send them back to their friends. Under the term of his plea deal, Gregory Ramos was sentenced to 45 years in prison for the murder of his mother. And although his eligibility for parole is set at 25 years, he will be on probation for life. Dylan Keglarek was not allowed to post bail when he was initially booked. The court was concerned that his prior mental health history may lead to him hurting himself afterwards. And so, for the next 309 days, Dylan was held without bond. By the time it was finally offered to him at $200,000, he had no way of paying for it. By Monday, February 8th, 2021, Dylan had spent 828 days in county jail. He pleaded no contest to a reduced charge of accessory after the fact to second degree murder. As a result, he was sentenced to 10 years of probation. Facing Gail's family, Dylan said, I know that it doesn't help with the pain, the loss, and the devastation that Miss Gale's family feels. It weighs on me heavily, so I'm asking for your forgiveness." Recognising his genuine remorse and cooperation with the police, Gale's family replied with, "'You are forgiven. You are deserving of better than what you have had. You are smart. You are capable. You have a future. You are not defined by your actions of November the 2nd, 2018. You are defined by what you choose to do from this day forward." On the other hand, Brian Porras, who was the other friend involved, was offered a $100,000 bond on the day of his booking, which, fortunately for him, his family posted. In the three and a half years between his release on bond and court date, Brian finished high school and then started college. And then, on July the 8th, 2021, Brian made his appearance in court. While his defence team argued that the previous three years demonstrated Brian's ability to live as a healthy, constructive member of society, the prosecution and Gail's family were not so kind. The prosecution asked that Brian be incarcerated for 828 days, that being the same number as co-defendant Dylan spent in county jail waiting for his court appearance. They then requested that this would be followed by 10 years of probation. In his defence, Brian claimed that, although he was helping his friend cover up the murder, he was in disbelief for the entire time. His family members also testified on his behalf, describing him as someone always there for his friends, who had expressed remorse since the incident occurred, and was trying to make something of his life. Brian's attorney argued that, although he did make a stupid mistake, there was no purpose for incarceration here, and he further claimed that Brian was now a productive member of society. Although Gail's family expressed forgiveness towards Dylan, and even commended him for his cooperation, they condemned Brian for keeping crucial information from the police while being questioned. It was noted that he didn't inform the authorities where they could find Gail's body, despite knowing her whereabouts. 
For his role in the murder of Gail Clevenger, Brian Perez was sentenced to 14 years of probation, with the first 364 days to be served in county jail. This was on the charge of accessory after the fact to second degree murder, which was the exact same charge given to his friend, Dylan. And with Brian's sentence formally signed, all trials and formalities concerning the murder of Gail Clevenger had finally concluded. With that said, empty courtrooms and marginal justice made way to empty hearts and marginal comfort. And now, Gail's family looked ahead at the long road to recovery. With cases like this, it is almost autonomous for us to focus on the unbelievable actions of Gregory Ramos. However, what we must never lose focus of here is who really matters, and that is Gail Clevenger. Gail was a bright, sensitive, and kind woman, with unending love and affection for the people that surrounded her. The testimonies made in court clearly showed that she was loved beyond recognition. Gail was a daughter, a sister, and a mother. She was a successful architect and harnessed impressive artistic capabilities. And despite her hardships earlier on in life, she gave so much to the world and was not yet ready to stop giving. Little did she know that the life she brought into this world would ultimately be the one to take her own away for good. Gregory Ramos's deplorable actions forever marked his family with an irreparable stain of grief and loss. And while some may call a sentencing justice, no matter how much time Gregory spends behind bars, his mother will never again be able to walk the earth, enjoy the sun, or spend time with her family. For this, I hope that he never finds forgiveness in himself. Meanwhile, I hope that Gail's family find the peace they deserve. And so concludes the story of Gail Clevenger and her son, Gregory Ramos. I know there are several other videos of this case already online on YouTube, but, at least personally, I wanted to make one that was a little more direct, and one that focused on Gail and the evidence behind it. Anyway folks, thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime, and apologies for any slip in quality as I record while I travel. I'm working on several things in the background here, and I really do hope you find them interesting. With that said, we've got several rather interesting videos coming up in the future, so keep your eyes peeled. In the meantime, if you want to see what I'm up to, then please check out my social media, most notably my Instagram. You can also follow me on Patreon if you want to support the channel. So, I guess I'll see you again very soon with another video, but until then, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.